As much as we wish it wasn't so, the opinions of others matter. A word of rejection, even something small that wasn't even aimed to really hurt, can stick and sting. Your rejection may be the cause of a recent happening. Uh, Perhaps it's something from way back in your past, but it's still there. And all people battle with some sort of rejection. You know, maybe your father didn't stick around to even meet you, or your spouse walked out the door and is now living in another uh, city with another woman and her two kids, or your parents split and you've had to adjust to life of being shuttled between families, or a trusted friend stopped taking your calls and responding to your text. You know, your sense of rejection could be big, or it could be more subtle. Maybe a sense of inadequacy stemming from something seemingly harmless at the time. We have come to the place in our series this morning to talk about rejection, the giant of rejection. You know, I don't know what may be the cause of your feelings of rejection. I do want to mention that Amanda Stockdale and her Sunday morning Sunday School Life group is beginning a new series next Sunday morning at 9.30 entitled Uninvited. It's a DVD study with a, a Turkhurst, Lisa. Her study is on rejection. Now, I'm not preaching her study this morning, so I encourage you to attend Amanda's class. You'll learn a lot as together you get much deeper into this topic of rejection. Actually, I encourage you uh, to attend any one of our life groups or Sunday school classes. You're all truly uh, missing a real opportunity to draw close to the Lord uh, if you're not involved. And I just want to take a moment, too, to thank Steve uh, for filling in for me last week. I had a little... Uh, time away. I went over to see uh, Kay's mother, and that was nice, although I have spent the last couple of weeks, if you'll pardon me uh, and not reject me, uh, for telling you that I've been working on passing a kidney stone, and I I am uh, pleased to announce that yesterday morning I gave birth to what felt like a 35,000-pound baby boy. Not... (laughs) Not very, not very cute either, but nonetheless, uh, though I'm not teaching Amanda's study, I, I will say that in the product description of Lisa's book, Uninvited, it said that the wounds of rejection dig deep into our sense of self and can resurface in surprising ways as an adult. And that's why we must say together that the giant of rejection must fall. The giant of rejection must fall. I'd like to ask you to pray with me before we get into this. Won't you do that, please? Father God, so often we listen to the lies of the great deceiver, Satan. We know that we shouldn't, but Satan can be relentless. His goal is to make us feel less than we are so that we no longer have the energy or the patience or self-worth to glorify you. So Father, we pray that you would speak to us this morning, especially in this area of rejection, so that we might live by the truth of your word rather than the lies of Satan. Speak to us, we pray, Father, because we want to glorify you in all that we say and in all that we do. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Please turn with me, if you would, please, to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17. Of course, we've been uh, spending a lot of time here in this particular chapter. You know, as you know, we've been studying David's killing of the giant Goliath. And, And what led David to kill Goliath? Well, first of all, he was a a Philistine that was... Uh, you know, uh, wanting to go to battle with the Israelites. And so that would be uh, probably reason enough. But let's take a look. Let's set the stage here, uh, looking at uh, chapter 17, uh, beginning in verse 17. Now, Jesse said to his son, David, take this ephah of roasted grain 
and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to the camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are being, uh, and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Now, early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other, and David left the, his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. Now, as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. And whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him, and he will also give his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. I'll just add, praise the Lord. Verse 26, now David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And they repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. Verse 28, when Eliab... David's oldest brother heard him speaking with the men. He burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. I encourage you to take your outline out of your bulletin if you care to follow along with today's message in that manner. You know, rejection can cause feelings of animosity. At the time David killed Goliath, he was still a teenager. You know, most scholars believe that he was probably between the ages of 12 and, and 16. Uh, he wasn't in the army like the rest of those that uh, were there that day. And as our text says, David was taking supplies to his brothers. He was asked to do that by his father, Jesse. And when David got to the camp, he heard about Goliath. He heard the taunting and, and didn't like what he heard. And so he asked who this giant was and who was going to take him down. But of course, his brother didn't appreciate uh, his question. He did not appreciate his uh, curiosity, if you will. So again, we see in verse 28, his brother's response, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are, David, and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. You know, I think it would do us well to kind of step back a little bit uh, because this response from Eliab isn't surprising if we know the rest of the story. You know, in Samuel chapter 16, we see that David had seven older brothers. The prophet Samuel came to uh, Jesse's house to anoint a new king for Israel. That was four to eight years ago from where we are in our text today. And Jesse, David's father, and Samuel asked Jesse to bring him all his sons. You may remember, Jesse started with the oldest, Eliab, the gentleman we're seeing here in our text today. Eliab came out and he was the biggest, he was the oldest, he was the strongest, and surely he was going to be the new king. But Samuel said, nope, not him. How about the next oldest brother? No. Not him either. The next? Nope. And then, of course, on down the line. David was so young that Jesse didn't bother to bring him in at first. His father left him in the field with the sheep. 
And so he was out there tending sheep, but Samuel asked to see him. And when David arrived, Samuel said, that's the one, anoint him, anoint him. Now, David did not become king that very day. Uh, He was Samuel's pick, which meant one day he would become a king. A few years later, at the time of uh, our text today, David still wasn't the king. But again, it was coming one day. He had been selected. Now, the day David, the young boy, was selected by Samuel, how do you think Eliab felt that day. Well, for one, I'm certain he was jealous of his little brother. I'm sure he felt spurned. I'm sure he felt rejection. The system seemed upside down. He wasn't chosen as king. But wait a minute, the youngest brother, the kid who wasn't even in the lineup at first? For us, this is a good reminder that God works in his own way. You know, it's not by the strength of men that battles are won. But you know, if you look back at um, chapter 16, because I think this is important to point out in verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, do you hear that? The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. For what purpose? It says right here, I have chosen one of his sons to be king. You see, he was selected by Samuel that day, but he, but he, but he was chosen by God. He was chosen by God. For us, again, a good reminder that it is God that is at work. And that's why in the account of David and Goliath, we, we've uncovered a huge revelation. We did it right from the beginning in our, in our studies here uh, that we are not David. Oh, we can learn a lot from David just as we have in all of our elementary classes and so on. He killed a bear, he killed a lion. Uh, we can learn courage from David and how to have courage. That's not bad teaching. I mean, David killed the giant. But it's not about us becoming David, really. It's not about us gathering our slings and stones and going down to kill the giant of rejection ourselves. No, God is going to do that for us. It's God that is working in our lives. He chooses the weak things to confound the strong, the simple things to upend the wise. In this case, God chose the youngest of all as a way of showing it's not the outward appearance that impresses God. It's the heart of faith. You know, David could have been as young as eight years old when Samuel selected him to be king. So when David showed up at the battle that day, a few years later, Eliab, his brother, should have been proud of him, not not put off by him. I mean, he could have said, hey, everybody, this is my little brother. I mean, he's going to be the king of Israel one day. He was selected by God to one day be the king. And I get to be the older brother of the king of Israel. I mean, isn't that amazing? Oh, he could have done that. I mean, Eliab would would turn to David and be the big brother God called him to be. Eliab would say, man, I'm here for you, David. Thanks for the bread and cheese, by the way. Eliab could have offered to fight to protect his brother. At least he could have encouraged David when his younger brother said he wanted a shot at Goliath. But that's not what happened. Why? Because Eliab is still bitter. He felt like he had been rejected, so he just burned with anger all these years. You know, my friends, whether it comes from within the family or elsewhere, Eliab, in this case, felt rejected. But here's what I want you to hear, because this is important for all of us. Rejected people reject people. Did you hear that? Rejected people reject people. 
I mean, if you feel rejected or you genuinely were rejected, it's likely you're passing on your sense of rejection to those that are around you. Perhaps you have lost your self-worth and you're no longer motivated. Maybe you work a lot of overtime trying to impress people. I mean, it's really kind of two sides of the same coin. You either feel like not doing anything because of your rejection or you just got to prove yourself and do everything. David was rejected by his brother, Eliab, because he felt he had been rejected years ago. You know, there was another time that David felt rejected. It was after he said he wanted to fight this giant. King Saul heard about it, and, and he brought David in, if you will, to talk to him. And, and Saul said to David, back to chapter 17, this time verse 33, Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. And he has been a warrior from his youth. In other words, hey, David, you're not good enough. You're not big enough. <laughs> you're not strong enough. You're not capable of this. You know, I think we've all felt this, again, in one way, shape, or form. And perhaps the messages were sent to us a little differently. You're never going to do that. Don't get any crazy ideas. Don't get your hopes up. You're never going to amount to anything. You're not smart enough. You're not talented enough. You're not beautiful enough. You're not worthy enough. You're not even wanted. <laughs> so David pressed through this. And, and eventually, he went out to fight the giant, at which point he felt yet another rejection. Look with me, please, at verse 42 of chapter 17. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome Goliath despised him. He despised him. You know, glowing, that word glowing referred to the color of David's cheeks. Perhaps your translation says ruddy. In other words, David wasn't weathered like a, a rugged man yet. He was kind of fresh-faced, if you will, and Goliath despised David partially because of all of that. And in verse 43, he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and to the wild animals. <laughs> Are you kidding me? First, David gets rejected because his older brother still feels rejected himself. Second, David gets rejected from Saul because David is, is too small. Third, David gets rejected from Goliath because he's just a rosy cheek kid. I mean, David can't win. <laughs> he gets it from all sides. The first and the last taunts, I think, probably were the hardest for David to hear. It's one thing to hear from the king that you're too small to wear his armor. I mean, the king was right. All he was trying to do was help. But to be slighted by your older brother has to be difficult. And then to be attacked by an enemy basically for being too cute to fight. I mean, that's got to be hard to take, for sure. The fact is, my friends, Satan, the enemy, will come at you with everything he's got. With everything he's got. Now, I'm not saying that David's brother or Saul was the devil, not at all, but sometimes Satan tempts us to say things and do things 
that are not of God. But why attack someone because they're too fresh-faced? Satan doesn't need a good reason to attack. That's why. Because in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to whom he can devour. My friends, no amount of money, luxury, or success can keep you from the possibility of rejection. Rejection comes after all of us in different ways. Now, some have incredible potential, but they don't want to try anything. Why? Because they don't want to fail. The easy choice is really to kind of live relatively safe in mediocrity because we think that that's better than rejection. So we just don't reach our potential ever. On the other hand, some might be determined to win at everything to prove that somebody that they are good enough, beautiful enough, worthy enough, wanted enough, so they will not rest until they are first in the class or the head of the organization, the most respected person in the group. You know, the thing is, they're never happy because they're holding up their self-worth based on their accomplishments. They don't know what they are going to do when their accomplishments aren't good enough anymore. And that is the same giant of rejection. That is the work of Satan. Some of the most beautiful people in our culture are the most insecure. Some get judged by others because they're too beautiful. Others, despite their parents, never feel like they're worth much inside. You can find models who are the saddest people on the planet because of the giant of rejection. And it's not just models either. It's people at the top of every category. Athletes feel as though they're one injury away from losing their position on the team or their income stream or maybe just the rejection by the fans if you're like luck and decide you want to retire early so that you don't kill yourself. Rejection. You know, you find incredibly smart people who are insecure because they feel like people only like them for what they know. You find competent and capable people who feel like they have an image to keep or an image to try to create. And the fear of rejection can lead you to some troubling spaces. You know, I just heard within the last couple of days that there are many congressmen and senators who are not going to run for election. We're probably happy about some of those. And, uh, but at the same time, um, I understand that there are many who are going to leave maybe after 10 years in office and so on. I mean, several. And, and it, it was surmised that maybe the reason they're doing that is because both operatives on both sides are digging so deep into these people's past to find any little thing that we know we all have a closet of some kind or another in our past. But it's the fear of rejection. They would rather quit than to have that come out and they be rejected. Right or wrong, I. The psychologists tell us one of the most powerful forces in humanity is acceptance. We all want to be accepted. It's, it's what we all crave. David's rejection could have caused him to think, I can't go on and accomplish the purposes of God for my life. But David pressed through all of that, and he arrived at the battle that day in a place of true acceptance. In a place of true acceptance. And this, my friends, is God's invitation to each one of us as well. Don't listen to all the lies of Satan. Rather, cover yourself in the true acceptance that Christ offers. Whether at school or work or with your peers or in your family, potentially face rejection every day. The only thing that will help us move past the giant of rejection is to immerse ourselves into the acceptance of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the answer right there. 
We need to arrive at the battle already feeling accepted. 1 John 3, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We're, we're children of God. You know, it's written in Isaiah chapter 40, 54, verse 17, no weapon forged against you will prevail and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And this is their vind vind vindication, excuse me, from me declares the Lord. We are children of God. Now here are four helps I want to go through very quickly. One, understand the miracle of your creation. Understand the miracle of your creation. David knew that about himself. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David wrote Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. For you created my inmost being. You, God, knitted me together in my mother's room. And I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And I know that full well. The giant of rejection does not want you to remember the miracle of your creation. He would rather you not know that you are wonderfully made, that your works are wonderful. For this giant to fall, for this giant to be rendered powerless in your life, immerse yourself in the fact that God made you, he made you uniquely, beautifully, intentionally, purposefully, and wonderfully. Realize that God chose each one of us through Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter one, verse four through five, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Okay, now there's a word chosen. God wants everyone. I mean, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And in Ephesians, it goes on to say in verse five, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. God chose everyone and he predestined each one of us to follow his plan. Unfortunately, not everyone will choose to follow his plan to accept him as their Lord and Savior and to follow him. So when we choose in the will and the way of Christ and we choose to follow him, then we become his children. We become his children. We're told that in the Gospel of John chapter one. God wants for each one of us to be adopted to the sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and goodwill to the praise of his glorious grace, which is freely given us in the one he loves. So before you ever felt the sting of rejection, God was holding you. That's important. God was holding you before you ever felt the sting of rejection. Number three, I want you to grasp how costly it was for Jesus to rescue you. How costly it was for Jesus to rescue you. You know, we develop true acceptance when we cover ourselves in Christ's acceptance. When we see the enormous cost that God paid when he sent his son to rescue us. Ephesians chapter one, again, in verses seven and eight this time, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. You see, the gospel, it's not just church talk. It's not just a, a good sermon. It tells every human what we need to know in the deepest part of our souls that we have an enormous worth to God. Faced with life without us, 
God's choice was to allow his son to die for us. God provided a way for us to be in a relationship with him from the very beginning of time. You see, our true net worth is Jesus Christ. Our true net worth is Jesus Christ. Our net worth is whose life was given for us. Praise God for this. You know, we never know when another global financial crisis could come along one day. The wrong two countries could get started new war even tomorrow. Financial markets collapse and the like. Maybe our worth is cut in half. But you see, our worth isn't wrapped up in what we achieve and what we accomplish, although we always seek to do our best, we, we should. But our net worth is forever anchored in the fact that Jesus gave his life for each of us. And you are worth Jesus to God. Did you hear that? You are worth Jesus to God. Now we live from acceptance, not for it. That's number four. We live from acceptance, not for it. Our giant of rejection is not going to fall until we admit that we desperately need acceptance. If you're too proud to say that you might likely have some demons in your past that still might be lurking in the shadows, you, my friends, were made to be accepted and embraced by our Heavenly Father. You were made to be loved for free. Good news is that in Christ we have everything we long for, everything we need. We are not working to gain his acceptance. Why? Because we already have it. We already have it. Sure, we want to be accepted by others. But let me tell you, first and foremost, we want to accept the fact that we are already accepted and loved by God. Please turn with me to Psalm 8, and then I promise we'll close. Psalm 8, it's in the middle of your Bible. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 8. You know, I can envision David as a young shepherd boy just laying in the pasture. As he writes in verse 3 and 4, Psalm 8, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, he's talking to God. The moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them. But you know, God answers in sort of a subtle way, and yet David is blown away by his answer. Look with me at verse 5. You, God, have made them a little lower than the angels, talking about us. We were made a little lower than the angels. And that's not a, a hierarchy kind of thing. You know, the angels are not over us. As a matter of fact, one day we'll judge them, the scripture says. But what it does mean is the, evil, the angels are up here in the spiritual realm and heaven and all those, and we're a little lower than the angels. So you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them, I want you to hear that, and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. That's us. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. And then David finishes off with, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, all oh Lord. As David is looking up into the immensity of God's creation, yet he still knows he has a relationship with the one who made the sun, who made the moon, the stars, and the heavens. God cares for you. With all that there is in the universe, he still knows your name. God has chosen you. He made you his son and daughter. He loves you. He cherishes you. And verse 5 says that God has crowned mankind with glory and honor. We are the very crown of God's creation, you and me. 
Now, it feels kind of crazy to think that God of heaven knows us, but you know what he does? <laughs> he does. Think about how awesome that is. We get freaked out when we get 30 likes on social media posts, and yet the God of the universe is mindful of us. We're all invited. And my friends, if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come and to give your life to him. Be baptized in, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, God living in you. And he will help you overcome all of these negative feelings that may come from being rejected. And again, 1 John 3, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. My friends, I'm gonna invite you to come. Maybe you're worshiping with us for the very first time, but you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. Maybe you've been worshiping with us for a long time and you're already an immersed believer, but you just never come to place your fellowship with us. We'd love to have you do that. So whatever God might be calling you to this morning, maybe it's a decision that you need to make right there where you sit. Maybe you've just been a little bit off path and you need to get back up and get on that path again. Whatever it is that you need to talk to God about, won't you do that during this time as we stand together and sing our invitation?